Well, thank you, Vim, for that gracious introduction. I appreciate it very much. I want to thank uh, Jack Templeton and the Templeton Foundation for uh, your wisdom and generosity in uh, arranging this wonderful event, and to Michael Velker for arranging, for inviting me to come. I'm very grateful to be here. And I want to thank Jack, too, so much for coming to CTNS last um, December and helping us celebrate our 30th anniversary. I'm delighted to come and help celebrate your 25th. This is a great event. Congratulations all around. Thanks to Mary and Myers for including me. So my topic for today is cosmology, creation, and redemption, three topics on the frontiers of theology and science. Let's see one of these buttons is going to do. How do we do the, the forward? Sorry. Oh, those buttons. Thanks. Great. So I've been asked to um, do an assessment of the accomplishments of the past and to look forward to the future directions uh, in each of these three topics. So first, creation, cosmology and creation ex nihilo. Uh, standard Big Bang cosmology, as Ted already mentioned, talks about a universe 13.7 billion years in age with an absolute beginning. And the question we have is, is T equals zero relevant for creation theology? So assessing the past. There are three responses to this. First, yes, T equals zero is directly relevant to theology. For example, T equals zero supports belief in God the Creator. Uh, examples are Pope Pius XII and currently Hugh Ross with his uh, ongoing program Reasons to Believe with 10,000 members, if you can imagine. And also, interestingly, the opposite view, yes, it's directly relevant from Fred Hoyle, and that it's so relevant that to an atheist like Hoyle, you have, to re, you have to replace Big Bang cosmology. And he's able to do that. Hoyle is a hero for me because he does what I'll talk about at the end of the lecture, and that is he actually goes from his theology, namely atheism, into science and does creative work in science inspired by his theology. That completes the circle and makes it creative interaction. So good. But note, note they're both direct, um, directly relevant supporters. On the other hand, there are those who say it's fairly irrelevant or completely irrelevant to theology. What counts is the dynamic and open character of the universe, not its beginnings. So John, I think I would take you as in that position. We can talk about it, maybe not. <laughs> Arthur, uh, dear friend, uh, and William Carroll, for sure. So the third view is that it is indirectly relevant to theology. Science provides confirmation for theology, but not proof. Science and theology are consonant, a term I got from Ernie McMullen, and added to it dissonance. Uh, and here are some supporters of that. Uh, one example is to use uh, philosophy as a mediating bridge between theology and science. I like the bridge metaphor, as you know. So contingency in philosophy mediates between contingency in theology, where you get absolute dependence of the world. Uh, it's contingent in terms of a dependence and creation out of nothing. Uh, and contingency in science, uh, one example is uh, having a finite past. And one example of a finite past is having a beginning t equals zero. So you don't directly relate creation ex nihilo to t equals zero, nor do you keep them totally separate, but you medi mediate the relations between by philosophy. Our first book in the Vatican series was called Physics, Philosophy, and Theology, A Common Quest for Understanding. Um, you can see the details in a recent book of mine. So future directions. Where do we go from here? Well, cosmology changes. Uh, and when it changes, will cosmology and creation theology still be constant? Consonant? This is an open question. It's a research question. We're doing research between theology and science. Now, my recommendation is, for those of us who are interested in this, build on the wonderful uh, conference and uh, research program that JTF has sponsored called New Frontiers in Cos Astronomy and Cosmology. I was delighted to go to that last week at the meeting in Philadelphia. Wonderful scientists there talking about frontier issues in cosmology where a standard Big Bang has long been uh, set aside for inflationary cosmology and so on. So there are at least three different kinds of, of areas you could look at here for new research in the relation of cosmology and theology. One is inflationary cosmology, second one is eternal inflation, and third is string theory in the multiverse. Now, some folks here are critical of that third one, but it's on the table for these scientists. And if you want to discuss theology and science with scientists who are involved in it, this is a great place to start. Okay? So, 
in inflationary cosmology, T equals zero is, to use John Barrow's term, undecidable. We, we simply can't say whether or not the universe had a beginning. In eternal inflation, there is no T equals zero, obviously. And in string theory, the problem's even worse. You have a perhaps uncountably infinite set of universes, at least 10 to the 500 universes, that raises the problem of theodicy with a vengeance. So the second question, um, continuous, continuous creation, cosmology and continuous creation, assessing the past accomplishments. Uh, does God act in the natural world which God creates ex nihilo, specifically in the evolution of life? Now, oh, here's a list of, what, a dozen, more than a dozen persons who look so different, but they all could be considered to be theistic evolutionists. They all could be considered to be people who support the idea that evolution is how God creates complexity, biological complexity. Maybe not the origins of life, that's a whole other question, but at least once you get it going. Now, Terry Deacon were here, he talked about the origins, but he's not here. Okay, so from Teilhard de Chardin to Karl Rahner, these are folks who would say, yes, God doesn't just create the world ex nihilo and sustain an existence, but acts within the world. God was clever enough to have created a world in which God can act uh, it, coherently and consistently with God's act as ex nihilo creator. Now, if we lived in a close, constantly closed world, this would be a problem. Ted pointed to this a second ago. Uh, it would uh, force Christians within both Catholic and Protestant uh, communities into a forced option. Conservatives would say, yes, God can act. God's action is objective. God really does things. But by intervening in the laws of nature, by breaking the processes or suspending them, Liberals from Schleiermacher forward will say, no, peace with science, God doesn't violate the laws of nature, but our notion of divine action is merely subjective. Remember Schleiermacher's famous uh, sentence from, from uh, the speeches, uh, miracle is a religious term for an ordinary event. Miracle is a religious term for an ordinary event. Nothing extraordinary happens. So that forced option is forced on us by science or actually the philosophical interpretation of science as deterministic, but in the 18th and 19th century, that's all we had. So what we need is what I call an iota, a non-interventionist objective account of divine action. It combines the best of the two views. It's only possible in an open, indeterministic world, at least open. Conservatives follow. Notice the splitting occurs not between within the church community. It occurs because of the elf in the room, which is the philosophical interpretation of science, which then causes the split within the church. In an indeterministic world, you still have the same splitting. You still have the choice between liberal and conservative, but now you have a third choice. This is a logical argument. It's a philosophical argument. You have a third choice, which is now a non-interventionist objective divine action. So now the question is, can, can you deploy this? Uh, in fact, are there theories in science where you could argue for a, uh, the world being open and indeterministic and therefore for Nauda? This is a summary of at least six responses to that question that are reflected in the Seafness Vatican series. I'm obviously not gonna get into the details, but if you wanna see my own evaluation of them, it's in the book, Cosmology from Alpha to Omega, chapters four to six. But I want to acknowledge that there's a Thomistic argument, a process argument, a whole part argument, a top-down argument, a lateral argument, and a bottom-up argument. And all these have strengths and weaknesses. Just to give you a picture of the volumes. Each focus on one area. Now, I think quantum mechanics is the least problematic because it can be interpreted in terms of ontological indeterminism. Un unambiguously, but it can also be interpreted else elsewhere, elsewise. But it also uh, provides real progress in theology and science because once you have a, once you interpret divine action through quantum mechanics, you can apply it to evolution. Q QM Nyota can be extended to support theistic evolution because it underlies key biological processes such as genetic mutations, which are essential to the neo-Darwinian evolution. They're not. Uh, a total, obviously not a total account of the sources of variation, but they're essential to them. 
So you've achieved epistemic progress by addressing the question of divine action in the quantum level and then saying, guess what, it's got surplus uh, epistemic, epistemic value at the level of evolution. So we have victory. No need for an interventionist theology of divine action, which introduces a divine agent to biology. ID is over, in principle. And Minot is finally defeated, precisely what he claimed in 1979, 72, as the blindness of evolution which precludes God's action is in fact the result of God's action. So in one move, we've given uh, teeth, strength, robustness to theistic evolution. We've gotten rid of ID, and we've gotten over the challenge of atheism claiming evolution as its own. That's a lot of progress. Now, the future. What questions should we now address as a community? Well, for one, I've already mentioned it. What happens if the beloved indeterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics is overturned? Supposing there's a doctoral student right now in philosophy of science at the University of Heidelberg whose thesis is it, you, cannot, you can no longer interpret it for certain reasons. And supposing that's a convincing argument. Well, that's an important uh, challenge to this pro project. But then this, this is research. It should be challengeable. Now, how do we respond to that? Well, I already had a beloved doctoral student face this challenge in choosing what topic for his dissertation, Kirk, Beck <coughs> Kirk Beckton McNally, who co-edited the volume on, a, on quantum mechanics with me. And we worked out a strategy. Move above the interpretations that associate with each of these nine or six or nine different ones, like indeterminism for, for um, Heisenberg, and look at one that transcends all of them. So you work at an interpretation independent level, i.e. quantum correlations or entanglement. All interpretations of quantum mechanics have to deal with this one fact, quantum correlations, and they'll be there even after quantum mechanics is replaced. So if you use this aspect of quantum mechanics, you're actually pointing beyond quantum mechanics to something which is going to be there when quantum mechanics is gone. So you're, you're safe from the problem of multiple interpretations. Second way you can do it is ask, are there new scientific areas concerning the everyday macroscopic world which support indeterminism? I'm so grateful to John Polkenhorn for his vision in saying he's, he's committed to the notion that God acts in the world. And if chaos theory uh, can't give us a, an open, indeterministic view of the world, maybe we can replace it with holistic chaos theory. We just give her lectures. Now, this again is like Hoyle. He's arguing from, from my point of view, a theological premise to, a, to developing a research program in science. And if I were a young student getting a PhD again, I would try to look for arguments for indeterminism in the classical world. Thank you, John. It's a great idea. Third question, it's third question generated from the success of the Naoda project in quantum mechanics. That is, if God really acts in nature, does this not exacerbate, probably beyond the pale, the problem of suffering, disease, death, and extinction, i.e. natural evil? Where is God in all this? If God's really acting, and we don't want to attribute it to God, where is, how is God acting? That has sent CTNS and the Vatican Observatory into a new collaboration. We've begun a new series of research volumes on this very issue. The first one is a picture there, physics and cosmology. Came out just after the tsunami came. So it was an amazingly personal, existential encounter with a tremendously important and difficult intellectual challenge. So those are three broad areas for future work in this question of divine action in the world. All of which I think are worth pursuing, and I hope we do. So the third one, this goes back to Ted's um, uh, points nicely. Eschatology from creation to new creation. This view is based on the bodily resurrection of Christ. It's not a resuscitation like for, it was for Lazarus, who later dies. It's not an immortal soul. It's not Gnostic. But it's bodily. And the key there is the empty tomb traditions as an indicator of the importance of matter to the new creation. Now, note the logic of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians, it was, it, it was intelligible to Paul that Jesus would, could have been raised because he believed in the general resurrection of the future. And this was the first instance of it. So the key to the intelligibility of Jesus' resurrection is that the future holds the general resurrection. That's why cosmology is a challenge. You might say, well, science can't challenge the one-off miracle of Jesus. But if the entire picture makes no sense, you've got a real problem. 
So if the implication of Paul is that the is that God will transform the present universe into the new creation such that there can be a general resurrection such that Jesus was risen, then we have a lot of work to do. Because, as Ted said, the cosmic future, according to Big Bang cosmology, even according to e inflation, the eternal, eternal Big Bang, is still the same future. The future that is the universe will expand endlessly and cool, i.e. cosmic freeze, marking the end of all life. So have we finally reached an unanswerable conflict between Christian eschatology and science? This problem has driven me sleepless for uh, several decades. Well, a, it, part of the past work has responded to the challenge initially, so let's give it, give it credit, but then we need to look at the future of this problem and see what we can do with it. So the, the first insight, it's very straightforward, John contributed to this, so did Nancy Murphy, so did uh, Wolfhard Pannenberg, and N.T. Wright has picked it up, and of course Ted and I, is that the challenge is actually not from science. The challenge is from a philosophical assumption we bring to science routinely. That is, well-honed scientific theories make predictions which must come true. Uh, the future, therefore, must be what science predicts. See David Hume, see Willock Boltmann, see John Dominic Crossan and the entire Jesus Seminar project. Okay. Now the point is they've all bought into a false, an unnecessary, not a false, an unnecessary philosophical assumption. If you say that the regularities of nature which science describes as ultimately due to the regular action of God as ongoing creator, if you say God, if God chooses to act in a new way, then the future will not be what science predicts. If God did act in a new way at Easter and promises to continue to do so, then the cosmic future will not happen. The cosmic freeze will not happen. So that insight was first published in the conference at Heidelberg, thanks to Michael organizing and contributing to it in our discussions at the conference and your work with John Polkinghorne on this. It's a wonderful team, team effort. OK, future directions. Um, how much time do I have then? Three, four minutes? OK, future directions. So. How do we continue the dialogue between Christian eschatology and science? How do we make an eschatology of universal transformation intelligible in light of science? Okay, it can't be forbidden by science because it's not predict, but does it make any sense? I mean, a universe of 15 billion light years in diameter, or actually it's 50 billion light years in diameter. Well, here, let me give you two non-starters and then one hopeful one, process theology. Well, they can offer us subjective and maybe, if you believe Ian Barber, objective immortality, but it solves the challenge by avoiding science. And it avoids the New Testament text in which the empty tomb uh, is explicit. And don't forget, it's the empty tomb, not the appearances, which say how important matter in some transformed form is to the new creation. And John made this point beautifully a couple nights ago. So this is uh, no starter. The second one is physical eschatology. Eschatology within the limits of science. Well, there's no conflict with science. The conflict is that you've, you've, you've gutted Christianity. It's not worth the price from my point of view, but you could do it. Okay, what's the third option? Well, the third one is to follow John, John Polkinghorne, obviously Jürgen Moltmann, and a few others in Quatio ex, ex vetera, the creation of the old, of the new out of the old. So it isn't the second ex nihilo, and it's not just the way things are now. It's a radical transformation. It includes continuities as well as discontinuities. If emergence assumes continuities with new novelty on top, like frosting on the cake, this one inverts it and says there's fundamental discontinuity, but there's some elements of continuity as well. It's not a second next thing yellow. And therefore, and this is the key wonderful, you know, the troops come home image uh, I want to leave you with, which is that now science has an essential role because science can help us discover those elements of continuity right here, right now. There are things about the universe right here, right now, from the Pythagorean theorem to agape love, which will be here forever. So if we can ask science certain questions about how to find those, science is our partner, our friend. Okay, that's a long ways from science giving this gloomy picture that threatens Christianity. And then we get ideas from people like Pannenberg and Ted about prolepsis, retroactive causality. The temporality and causality of the eternal eschatological future is manifest in the everyday flowing time and natural processes because of the resurrection. Well, this says that eschatology, and this is really unique now, eschatology can inspire new research directions in science. 
Um, it, it, it means we can ask questions about nature because we have a certain vision about its real future, which are in some ways true about it now, and therefore in some ways must be what science is studying or could study. It either uh, generates criteria of theory choice between existing theories, or generates new theories in science which reflect these truths. Um, I call it creative mutual interaction, and thank you, Ted, for showing the picture of the book. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known you were gonna do it. Um, pushback from theology to science. New research, for example, and this is the work I'm act actively engaged in now. New research in time in physics in light of eschatology. So can we look for a temporal duration uh, in physics? Can we look for a fractal-like view of time, time in physics? Can we look for what I call co-presence, uh, playing off Boethius, in time now? Can we look for multiple splittings in time now? Can we look for backwards causality in time now? Well, how do you proceed? Build on the Templeton, I say, build on JTF's funded programs, the new Frontiers One in cosmology, FQX on time and physics. Put their scientific results into creative mutual interaction with theology, and you have the future. Thank you. Missing one of the speakers now. Oh, Wetzel. Uh, okay, um, I'll start here and then move gradually in that direction. Yeah. Maybe you can introduce yourself. I have to laugh some more, but just a little bit. Thank you. Ted, Ted and uh, uh, Bob said, and then one question to Benson. <coughs> Since we did this resurrection project here together, we had uh, several other science and theology projects which continued, uh, did not move to Berkeley and the insights, but which continued our research on these topics. And I think the first step was in the old eschatology, John's insight, that we should work with continuity, discontinuity in eschatology. That helped to gain eschatological realism. Uh, then we had the continuity, discontinuity in the resurrection, and we became very, very tough on no reanimation. This was our consensus, despite the fish eating in Luke. Otherwise, you get always this dual message, palpability and appearance, theophany and doubt. So obviously, a um, different reality. Uh, then we had the frontier, and this was the end of our discourse. Uh, what is a spiritual body? Yeah, this was the tough point. Then we started to work on anthropological issues and, um, and saw the important differentiation um, between flesh and body. Uh, so that the body is already mind-loaded, spirit-loaded over against uh, the um, yeah, self-sustaining uh, dimension of uh, flesh, that the body is partly uh, flesh, but you can then also start thinking about a body abstracting from the fleshly ex existence. Uh, where the mind and the spirit are, so to speak, invested. And so we continued to work on this kind of, and this is exactly the creatio ex vetera. That's, it's, it's, it's already a transformation witnessed here and then plausibilized by an understanding of a body that takes in other fleshly existence. In. So here you get the transformation, uh, the spiritual transformation and so on. So uh, what I learned from this meeting is we need continued conversation. Um, the uh, uh, second point, Wenzel, can you make sense of what uh, John and I try to develop under the under, uh, understanding of truth-seeking communities, both in science and in uh, theology? And here we try to develop standards that truth-seeking communities are not just going around with diverse models. No, they establish truth claims and they have to be to put to test under certain uh, um, uh, agreed and negotiated conditions. But in truth-seeking communities, you have the interesting process of co-enhancement of certainty and consensus without confusing truth and certainty and consensus, uh, and also coherence and topica topical insight. 
and you have a mutual challenge between these two processes. You are seeking for certainty and consensus and so on, uh, and have these kind of truth theories, and we are looking for coherence, consistency, and topical insight, and these two uh, yeah, growth challenge each other. And here you get clear conditions for truth-seeking communities and progress of insight. So could you make sense of such a project? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I would love to hear more about this and what exactly you mean. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, uh, when you ask this kind of question, uh, it, it's one of the questions that immediately reveal how different uh, theology is from science. Uh, in term, uh, different only uh, in terms of not only the disciplinary uh, uh, identity, but what the aims and goals. Uh, I mean, one could, you know, in a popularized version, say science is all about uh, 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 fallibilism and, and falsification. Yes, we do. We spend thousands, and millions of dollars on science and to move ahead. And, and to increase knowledge and truth seeking, but science is, in, in essence, uh, it's about the survival of the fittest theories too. It is, uh, so in that sense, science is never closed off. In the sense that Bob Toe uh, said, uh, or maybe Ted said, uh, that even with Big Bang cosmology, uh, this is the kind of tentative theory holding that we are up to as we move ahead. Uh, the, uh, Theology or religion is, is different in the sense that we live on two levels. There's a, a level of devotion and, uh, and personal belief and communal belief that, that uh, commits to a certain kind of religious truth or, or, or a scriptural truth, if you're Christian. Uh, uh, and then the level of theology, which is much more uh, reflective and uh, f focused on uh, truth-seeking, but then also, in a sense, and how do we improve, how do we, uh, uh, how do we solve problems so that we can better, uh, along with science, uh, do the kind of interdisciplinary work that we're talking about. So I think uh, uh, in, in the theology and science dialogue, uh, it's all uh, this kind of problem solving and uh, advancement of progress, if you want, is often retrospective. The kind of solutions that we found and now can identify, but it could always move ahead. Now, I think the more difficult problem is for theologians is how do you feed that back into uh, the daily lives of believing people and theological students uh, uh, that needs to know this, but uh, are also living on a level of commitment uh, to faith and, and truth that are slightly different from from both the interdisciplinary conversation and science as such. That's the first quick answer. Okay, four hours for the break. Maybe we, but let's, yeah. Thank you. Um, John Paul from Cambridge. Just a couple of quick comments for we've heard this <coughs> afternoon. First is to say, point out that uh, the obvious fact that the existence of intrinsic unpredictability of nature, whether at the quantum level or the macroscopic level of chaos theory, um, which are capable of being interpreted as representing a um, uh, space, the operation of other causal principles. So that's not logically necessary, but it's certainly a possible interpretation. That serves, I think, to show that science, on its own terms alone, has not established the causal closure of the world. I think that, that's the most important and significant conclusion reached from that, but pointed out by that wise man known among the defeat of the defeaters. The other thing I want to say is that uh, it's about questions of agency, whether we're thinking about human agency or divine providential agency. It would be hopelessly ambitious, I think, to suppose we're in a position to provide a fully articulated account of agency. No doubt it occurs at all sorts of levels, and then obviously co cooperation at all sorts of levels um, uh, the microscopic, the macroscopic, the holistic, and, and, and so on. <coughs> so the particular investigations to which Bob referred to really represent, I think, thought experiments. And to see, I, again, a little bit what, what, what exploring these possibilities might mean. That's it. Okay, connecting various lectures, but not so much a question, I think, but more no, a comment. Okay. Uh, Jeff Schloss, you have raised your hand. Uh, thank you, all of you, for your uh, really stimulating presentations. I have a question for Ted. Um, your distinction between what you called uh, archonic and epigenetic um, views here. First of all, thank you for using epigenetic in the broader and more provocative sense of what it's typically meant in 
in developmental biology. Um, and th there actually is a word uh, that I think that biologists use for what I think you mean by archonic, and that's preformationism. This debate oh, between yeah. whether there is a fully formed, but just tiny version of the organism in the embryo versus an emergent form. And I think you're arguing against the former, but I, my question is this. I'm not sure, do you really get what you want out of the latter? Because an epigenetic view of development still suggests that everything is already there. Uh, and that although the form progressively emerges over time, to use Bob's uh, metaphor, nothing really new happens. And it seems to me like you want to suggest that something new does happen. And the last part of this question is, what then would you make of Julian Hart's uh, criticism of, uh, what's his name? The theologian you cited, Smuts. Oh, Jan Smuts. Yeah, that, that in fact, um, he was getting uh, the whole too cheaply and didn't recognize that uh, you needed something new to overcome the, the conflicts within the whole in order to get the, the better whole. Uh, I didn't quite get that last part. Julian Hart's criticism of Smuts is... Was that he's, he had kind of a bland and saccharine holism that didn't realize the, the barriers to getting the kind of a whole that Christian theology wanted to affirm. <clears throat> Two questions. One is, um, does epigenetic really do the job I want it to with regard to uh, newness? And then, um, uh, secondly, um, depending upon Jan Smuts, is it is is holism in, in biology of so much less than what a Christian theologian wants to say it is? Did I get your questions, or? Well, the second is just a, uh, um, a, a tangible example of the first large question. Okay, question, all right. Is, I thought I know, thought I need some help from from outside yeah. to get something really new. To get the whole um, thing new. Uh, with regard to the first one, I think the very words that we have to use, new versus old, the words already create the problems because is there continuity or discontinuity? And if you say there's continuity, then well, what's really new? <laughs> and um, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons why looking at uh, holism, uh, or the emergence of complex organisms in evolution is good, is that all of the parts were there beforehand, but the phenomenon that uh, makes its appearance for the first time in history uh, is uh, different. Uh, one of our Vatican uh, studies was on the origin of the laws of nature, and there's a sense in which all of the laws of nature weren't there at the beginning, they appeared at different periods of time. Well, if you're a Platonist, you'll say, well, but they were always there. They just didn't manifest themselves. Um, but, uh, and so you could go round and round on that one. But uh, the point is that there are new phenomena, even if you don't change the material substrate um, uh, from which the new phenomena appear. And let me just say, that's good enough for me uh, to, in order to um, have a coherent description uh, of, uh, of talking about a dynamic world that is changing. And um, it's also, and I'm trying to sneak in a middle premise here, uh, when we think about healing, we usually think about holism as the method for uh, healing. And so there is almost a built-in uh, salvific dimension to uh, the dynamic of moving towards um, holes that, uh, that heal. Uh, granted, I would need to be able to support that with some uh, other arguments, but is there something in the natural world that introduces new things that weren't there before, and is that consonant with the way we understand God as being a God of promise? Uh, that's about as much mileage as I can get out of that. Given time, I think I would like to collect questions, uh, certainly. So Andrew Murray, John Brook, I think, Andrew Briggs, uh, Antje Akkelein, uh, Frederick Nussel, uh, Jennifer. I think that would be quite a few questions, at least, to have on the right and see who responds and, and leave it at that. Uh, yeah. All right, so we'll get a chance to test your memory. Uh, first of all, 
Um, thanks, everyone, for a very fertile session. Bob, I really appreciate the fact that you uh, included a lot of very specific and forward-looking uh, <coughs> research ideas in the field. That was uh, very helpful. I'll make this really fast. You'll have to fill in the blanks if you think there are blanks. So the one was a, regarding a, a very quick comment, which was that uh, uh, multiple worlds or multiverses uh, would increase the problem of theodicy. And I'd like to hear you explain why, because I don't see why that would be the case. And the second is, um, I really appreciate the point about eschatology and you pointing to what you claimed was the real problem, which is the acceptance of the Humean claim that the future will continue to be as science says it will be. But if that's a, an assumption you we're willing to give up, then I don't see what the problem is for interventionist conceptions of divine action. Thank you. It's, it's to Bob primarily, but in the spirit of John Paul Kinghorn's suggestion that the nioda may simply represent a, a, a kind of thought, thought experiment. Um, are you not, with your account of mutations, um, sanitizing and streamlining an evolutionary process, which at, at more or less every stage involves a whole spectrum of mutations, a very, very small proportion of which have turned out to be propitious if one looks um, retrospectively at the way evolution has gone. And I just can't quite see how you discriminate then between God's action in producing variations that are, if you like, prospective or propitious, and those which in many, many cases are to the detriment of the organism. This, incidentally, is Asa Gray's objection to Charles Darwin and Charles Darwin's reply, saying that Gray has sanitized and streamlined the process. <coughs> this is a question about the role of hypotheses in thought experiments. And uh, the einstein podolsky rosen experiment in defense of your hometown of Copenhagen was not um, an attack on Niels Bohr's position so much as uh, a thought experiment, the hypothesis of which was that quantum mechanics, as formulated by Schrodinger and others, was incomplete. And so it was a thought experiment in the laboratory of the mind to test a very specific hypothesis. To what extent does that carry over to the other kinds of thought experiments that you were talking about, including thought experiments in theology? Well, thank you. Um, I have a question about the um, concept of non-inter... Um, sorry, inter... Um, Intervention is, I, I put my glasses on. Objective divine action. Um, I, I think it is very important and for many theological reasons um, to um, uh, give up this inter idea of intervention from outside and, and uh, whatever, because this makes um, not only problems in the discourse with the, um, uh, sciences, but also in, in theology itself. But um, I wonder uh, how you can say it is objective. And I, um, in Pannenberg, we have the idea that uh, the real reality of God himself uh, is under the process of his self-realization. So um, uh, it will turn out in the end whether God himself really exists. And this le leaves a um, rest of not objective existence. And I just wonder what um, uh, uh, this argument plays, uh, what role uh, this argument plays in your um, argument. Um, and another question is, um, um, what about uh, the religious believer and um, integrating the relig re religious practice of prayer? Because I think this seems to um, um, uh, rely on some kind of intervention. How, how do you refer to that? Yeah, I try to be brief and hope I'm still intelligible. I was sort of puzzled. I wondered whether or not Ted and Bob should shift places in the presentation because it seemed to me that, Bob, you took away a little bit of what Ted was giving or another way of saying it was uh, 
isn't the concept of ni starting with Nyota, the way <coughs> you develop it, going back to an iconic way of, of featuring the whole question of eschatology? And doesn't it end up uh, more in like a, a, a view of the future as futurum and not as advent? And thus it takes away something of the eschatological pull that, that uh, Ted was advocating. Uh, I'm still looking forward to, to reading your book, Time in Eternity, but it's, it seems to suggest that uh, even here, uh, something of the, the eschatological tension that you get when you say, oh, time is not in eternity, but eternity is the other of time that, that pulls and interacts and so on, that would give more of, of what Ted is suggesting. I think you'll need eternity to answer all these questions. <laughs> okay, open future. Uh, my question is for Professor, uh, for Professor Gregerson. Um, you mentioned this thought experiment of meeting this alien civilization that's more intelligent and more virtuous than we are, but this civilization has no religion. And I believe you said that that would pose a serious challenge to your Christian faith. And so my question is, uh, isn't our Christian faith, um, by the way, I'm Jennifer Wiseman from the AAAS, sorry, isn't our Christian faith based on the recognition, in fact, in some sense, that we're not virtuous and that we need salvation in this intervention? So would this more virtuous or perhaps per perfectly virtuous civilization, would they really need the kind of savior that Christianity recognizes, or what kind of of faith would you have envisioned them having that would reaffirm your, that would not trouble your Christian faith? So. Uh, no, there, there are a lot of things that we can make, but just to conclude the session for now, uh, give you the uh, word and at least to, to start responding. You? Oh, first, oh. the longer list. Doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you all for these great questions. I wish we had a lot more time to, to talk about them. Um, yeah, Michael, you're right. You, if I'm going to say pace hum, I could fall back on, on intervention's account of, of the resurrection and new creation. I actually want to go further and say it's more than a miracle because it's a change in the laws of nature. So I'm going to actually, so when, there is too much in one talk, but when I move from nauda in evolution, which is non-miraculous divine action, nauda, to resurrection and eschatology, which is transformation of, of the laws of nature, I'm going to a, a larger category than miracle, which keeps the laws as they are and then suspends them in some event. Okay. Um, mutations and sanitizing nature. <laughs> I, I, that's what I meant to, I, I agree. I mean, my, my confession as a Christian is that the problem of evil is practically insurmountable. Tillich says it's the one irrational element in the entire system. And you have to assert the, the irrationality. Otherwise, you, you begin sanitizing it. What I want to do is get God back into the process. I, want to, I don't want to do it by ID, I don't, but I don't want to do it with Arthur and say God just brings the changes. That's, that's what I call statistical deism. I want God to really be a part of the process, responding to it and acting in it. But then it, then it raises the question of theodicy, and that's what we're doing in the new series. So I want to separate those two and actually want to move the problem of suffering and evil from the doctrine of creation, where you cannot solve it. That's why Moltmann said in his uh, Crucified God, you, you generate atheism if you do that. You, I want to move it into the context of redemption. That's what God does about evil is die on the cross and transform the world. Okay. So, I, so I, don't, I don't want to sanitize evolution, but I want to say God is really involved in those processes. Okay. Um, the, the general question is, of intervention is simply to acknowledge <clears throat> I'm using in a very technical term the human notion of breaking the laws of nature. I'm not using it in the general sense that God acts in the world. I want to preserve God's acting or intervening without making that a God who is distant from the world, not a, a separate God, it's God present in the world. And, and finally, on the future versus Adventists, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I'm, again, going too fast. I buy into and accept both Ted's and Panaberg's use of the distinction between Adventists and Futurum. Um, what, what I was doing with Nauda was talking about evolution, not about eschatology. I, I, don't even, I don't mention now that in the eschatological section because it's inadequate to the problem. But it doesn't distinguish between the two kinds of futures. That's the very point. And, and, the, and I agree with Panenberg and Ted 
that the eschatological future is proleptic in the present. So it's the lure or the draw is, it, is it, its manifestation in the present. Okay, thank you. Okay, some for Thank you very much. And first to Andrew. Um, my thank you also for your clarification of the. I just mentioned in passing. My point is that there are destructive thought experiments like Schrödinger's cat, aiming to show the absurdity of uh, the Copenhagen uh, presentation. We have Maxwell's demon as a positive thought experiment, showing the logical possibility that you can can. Uh, uh, transport uh, heat from colder system to warmer systems it's not very likely but if the if the demon could do could do the trick it could be done then actually uh, the 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 uh, einstein uh, podolsky rosen uh, uh, dilemma or paradox uh, was uh, in a sense both meant to be critical and to be uh, to be positive and i think you're right it 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 actually wanted to show the incompleteness of the of the uh, copenhagen interpretation and um, it also wanted to press no, for... Not, not of the interpretation of, of the underlying quantum mechanics oh, behind the Yeah, okay, thank you for the clarification. You are much, I am, I'm, not clear, well, not, I'm not clear enough, on, and I haven't really been going through that, uh, uh, that uh, thought experiment in, in detail. The interesting thing is here that it actually has been a basis for physical experiments. And you cannot say, well, then actually uh, uh, the, the uh, Copenhagen quantum mechanic theory is, is the, it has been shown to be complete. But at least it was not incomplete in the way in which uh, 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 Einstein and his colleague had imagined. So what has this to do with theological thought experiments? First of all, it's not very often that we have this kind of crucial experiments in, in, uh, in religion as we don't have it in philosophy. But, uh, uh, but I do think there's something very important, which is that you're using common sense conceptions about what is absurd and what is not, what would be absurd and what would not be absurd. And then you're pressing the issue in, a, in, in, in some sense. Uh, so uh, I think this is the common. Uh, uh, does, it, it, does it need a hypothesis? Does, does, oh. does the concept of a hypothesis my, carry over? No, I point. No, I point. Uh, my point was actually that it is wrong, as it's often suggested in the lit literature, to say that a thought experiment is in itself a hypothesis. I, th I, I say it's it is suggesting hy hypothetical uh, scenario, which of course can be formed into some hypothesis. So this was the, and, and I mean, I think there's not very much clarity on this in the literature if you look into these. Uh, uh, philosophy of science uh, stuff. Then the other uh, uh, question, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, um, Jennifer. First of all, my problem was not about the, 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 the uh, of, about being good. Uh, but uh, if you ask me as a Christian theologian, I would say that, and I had this actually on the incarnation chart, that, uh, the, uh, that uh, the incarnation and redemption did not only happen Incarnation did not only happen in order to remedy the human sinning, uh, uh, but actually in order to be a, to have a, a higher level of unification between uh, uh, God and, and 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 creation. So I'm following this scotistic position, uh, going back to Scotus in the Middle Ages, and also pursued by. Karl Rahner and many other in, in, in today's uh, theology, rather than the Thomistic uh, solution, which is also the Lutheran one, that actually Christ came in order to heal human suffering. So I think that already if you have a theory of incarnation which is broader than just about re redeeming evil, then I think it is you have a better access to, to Etai thought experiments. What I think was interesting uh, uh, with, with this thought experiment uh, about people being both intelligent and, and more intelligent and better than we are, but having no idea of, of, of religion or God, I think that would be a real challenge. It would not be an, an it would be the same challenge that we already have in uh, by if you're saying that you have very very good virtues holy like people who are not religious so it, it is not something totally new but I think if you had this so to speak uh, cosmic white 
I think then you would have to think, well, is religion just a whimsicality of the human mind? So I think it would actually uh, constitute a challenge for theology. And I wanted to make now a, a, a challenge in, in a thought experiment, which would not relegate the question about verification or falsification to the ultimate future, as it is, uh, for example, in, in, in my own teacher, Wolfgang Pannenberg's work. So I wanted to find some, some, some traction with some possible modes of falsification within a, a scientifically uh, uh, understandable uh, universe. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we should realize that all four of the history was fun back uh, in their theological <laughs> work. True. That's true. Uh, yes, well, thank you for sitting, uh, two hours attentively. Uh, and this conference is not called, I think, the that we close the science of religion discussion, but there's a future to it, and there are many open issues, but not for this moment. Thank all four speakers. Uh,